Um, all right, it's just after three o'clock, so let's go ahead and start. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the first marine science uh, seminar of the fall semester. Jeremy and I are very excited to have you all join. Uh, just as a reminder, and for those who are new, we're trying to schedule these seminars roughly once a month or so at the uh, Wednesday 3 p.m. slot. So right now we expect that these seminars will be virtual for the rest of the semester. Um, and then we hope that we could perhaps start in-person seminars or some sort of hybrid seminar series in the spring. So um, stay tuned for updates. All right, so I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Dr. Kirk Weinmiller. Uh, he is a distinguished university professor, a regents professor, and senior faculty fellow in the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences at Texas A&M University. Uh, his research addresses questions pertaining to fish population and community ecology, life history strategies, and food web ecology, with an emphasis on rivers, streams, and estuaries. Uh, he's conducted field research at locations throughout Texas, as well as tropical regions across the world, including uh, Mexico, Guatemala, Southeast Asia, and the Amazon Basin. Um, through his research, he's published an impressive 250 scientific articles uh, across a wide range of journals, including Science, Ecology, Ecology Letters, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences. Uh, I'll, I'll also mention he's recently co-authored a, a new first edition book on the diversity, ecology, and natural history of the peacock bass. Uh, Dr. Weinmiller received his master's in zoology at Miami University and a PhD also in zoology at University of Texas, Austin. Uh, lastly, he has received multiple institutional and professional awards, uh, just to name a few. In 2007, he was elected as a fellow to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in 2018, he received the AFS, the American Fisheries Society Award for Excellence in Research. Uh, so with that, uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker whose talk is entitled, uh, Response of Estuarine Fish Assemblages to Patterns of Precipitation and Hydrology. Uh, and Dr. Weinmiller, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Justin, and thanks everyone for joining us today online. Uh, it's a shame we have to do these things this way, but um, that's kind of where we're at. Um, I will mention that my department has changed. So I was in the Department of Wildlife and Fishery Sciences at Texas A&M, but we went through a restructuring about a year and a half ago. So I'm in the new Department of Ecology and Conservation Biology now and actually serving as the interim department head. And if you all know uh, anyone who's interested in being a department head, uh, send them my way because we have an active search going on. So Joel, if you can hear me, uh, there's, there's an opportunity there. Okay, so, um, so this is a marine uh, science, marine biology seminar series. So I was asked to present um, some material from work we've done over the years involving uh, coastal systems. So this is not a seminar I normally give, but I'm, I'm happy to do it. Actually, pieces, pieces of this I have been presenting uh, recently and, and you'll see towards the end. Um, so I'm gonna focus on the role of, of hydrology and uh, freshwater inflows and estuarine systems. And let's see if I think I've got to advance this way. Okay. I'm sure uh, everyone listening knows that um, estuarine ecosystems are among the most dynamic on the planet. They're constantly in flux, it seems, under the influence of a variety of drivers. Uh, we've got coastal currents offshore that affect estuaries obviously tides and wind can have a major influence uh, in shallow areas. Uh, obviously temperature in temperate zones, uh, but also dial heating in, uh, in very, very shallow waters can be a big factor. Uh, and then precipitation and freshwater inflows. That's gonna be my main focus today. 
And along with freshwater inflows, we have sediment and nutrient delivery into estuarine ecosystems that affect productivity. And then finally, animal migration. A lot of the species that inhabit estuarine uh, ecosystems and form their communities uh, are migratory, some very highly migratory. Let's see. So with respect to uh, hydrology and pre precipitation, you know, we have some drivers that are large scale events. These large scale climatic conditions like tropical storms and hurricanes. And also mention um, in the talk today, ENSO phenomena, the um, El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a decadal scale variation in climatic conditions that affects large regions of the planet and certainly uh, many estuarine regions. And just as one example, Hurricane Harvey that hit the upper Texas coast in uh, 2017 dropped up to 40 inches of rain over four days in the Houston metropolitan area and surrounding region. And um, this was a very expensive major natural disaster well, I should say natural in quotes because um, a lot of this impact was due to the infrastructure that's been built up in this coastal area. And so imagine all that water flowing into the bayous and the rivers that drain into the Galveston Bay uh, that had to have a huge impact on ecosystem dynamics in, in this estuarine area. And increasingly, uh, freshwater inflows and hydrological dynamics are affected by things humans are doing in the watersheds. So this is a shot of the Rio Grande estuary on the border of Texas and Mexico. It's a, it's a pretty small outlet and much smaller today than it ever was historically. And that's because of the water withdrawals and diversions that have taken place throughout the Rio Grande Basin. This is the, uh, the fourth or fifth longest river in all of North America, a once mighty river and major stretches of the Rio Grande are now completely dry during various intervals. And that's uh, totally due to human overuse of the, of the freshwater resources. Texas is an interesting place to study um, coastal and estuarine systems. We've got all along our coastline, a series of barrier islands. And behind those barrier islands are um, a series of bay systems. And those bay systems receive uh, inflows from a variety of rivers, both major and minor. So I'm gonna talk about Matagorda Bay. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, Matagorda Bay is here, and I'm going to talk about some work we did in this region uh, here in a minute. And Texas is also uh, interesting, at least for me, because of the series of independent river basins that crisscross the state from east to west. And accompanying um, that gradient of river basins is also a strong rainfall gradient. So East Texas is a, a climate much like Louisiana. And as you move West, it becomes progressively drier and drier. Um, and West Texas is, is pretty serious desert terrain. But along with that is some interesting zoogeography. If, if you study fish, um, there's quite a transition in endemic species as you move across the state. But all these rivers uh, eventually empty into our our, uh, our bay systems along the coast. So I'm gonna talk first about some research that we did several years ago at a site called Mad Island Marsh. It's a uh, nature preserve owned by the Nature Conservancy of Texas. Uh, it supports a lot of bird life. That was one of the motivations for acquiring the property. And uh, this was work that uh, went into the doctoral dissertation of a former student of mine, Shinola Kin. 
Chanel's uh, from Turkey, and he's currently um, a department chairman of a biology department at a major university in Turkey. But as a graduate student, Chanel uh, did a project um, with help from others in the lab at Mad Island Marsh. And so you can see on this map, <clears throat> his survey sites, there are six survey sites. They run a gradient from where the freshwater inflows are coming in at the top. Uh, there is some human impact on, on the water flows in the system, but it's fairly minor. It's a marshy area, so you're getting a lot of uh, freshwater input at the top of the system, and then it becomes progressively more saline as you move down here through this channel to the outlet to the intracoastal waterway that runs along the, the northern fringe of Matagorda Bay. And so we surveyed over, um, over a year at these six sites and measured some of the environmental attributes that you see in these graphs here. And what I've highlighted in yellow is the peak summer months. So during the summer months in 1998, 99, you know, obviously it's warmer. Uh, it tends to be more saline. Uh, dissolved oxygen concentrations tend to be low. Um, it tends to be more shallow and there's much more aquatic macrophyte coverage uh, throughout the system during the summer months. And on the right-hand side, you just see that there's a bit of a gradient in most of these uh, environmental parameters as you go from the upstream to the downstream sites towards the, uh, the mouth of this estuarine system. It's a small estuarine system. And we look at the number of fish species um, that we collect across the spatial gradient from upstream to downstream through time. It peaked in the summer months and particularly across the board, but with highest richness at the more saline uh, downstream sites. And we, when we look at the relationship of environmental conditions with fish species composition in the samples, you can see uh, there are strong gradients of depth, salinity, and temperature. So the, the downstream sites dominating at this end of this dominant gradient from a canonical correspondence analysis, and then lower dissolved oxygen in these vegetation choked areas further upstream. Although those conditions did occur at times, even in the downstream sites. And a major um, feature of this system is widgeon grass, Rupia maritima, really, really dense during um, certain periods of the year, particularly in the late summer, early fall. So another thing that <clears throat> Chanel and I did was looked at the food web uh, structure in this system uh, through time. And here I'm just comparing the summer and winter periods. And this is a graph based on a gut contents analysis, a volumetric uh, estimation of uh, items found in the guts of both fish and uh, macro crustacea at this site. And so what this is showing is the volumetric percentage when we sum across all consumers in our samples. And you see that it's strongly dominated by detritus. So a lot of detritus is being consumed both during the summer and winter period. Um, followed by um, algae. And then we see a variety of things that are consumed by some of the fish species at higher trophic levels. And the proportions vary a little bit seasonally, but, but not hugely for most of these. And this is a huge table that you definitely don't wanna try to read everything, but I, I'm just putting up here to show a couple of things and to make one important point. Uh, about research involving gut contents analysis. Uh, when Chanel told me he wanted to use this methodology, I tried to talk him out of it. 
because it's my contention that uh, to have a robust um, dietary analysis based on gut contents, you really need large sample sizes. And uh, you know, for a seasonal study where you're, where you're comparing seasonal trends, you know, my advice to him was, you, you're gonna wanna have at least 200 individuals of each species and 300 is better and more is even better. But of course you're limited by what you're able to capture during your surveys in the field. So this just, this column shows you what some of his sample sizes were like. I mean, some of them are pretty robust. Um, and then this column is the, um, the, the frequency of detritus, the, the relative proportion of detritus uh, for the various species. And this is for the summer months. This final column is trophic level, an estimate of trophic level based on volumetric proportions of the various uh, diet items and their estimated trophic levels. And there is an algorithm that we use to compute that. But you can see that a number of species have diets very strongly dominated by detritus. And this was true also during the winter. Um, and then these ones highlighted in blue are freshwater species. So like many estuaries, and I'll talk about this uh, shortly and some of the other studies that I'm gonna report on here, uh, you know, you often get a mixture of freshwater and marine and sort of estuarine dependent marine species. And this site at Mad Island Marsh was no different. Uh, and these were three pretty common freshwater species uh, that we obtained throughout, throughout the year at this site. Uh, alligator gar are pretty prevalent on the Texas coast, all up and down the Texas coast, all the way to the Rio Grande. And actually, Texas is still um, a stronghold for the alligator guards. It's a threatened species in many uh, areas throughout its uh, native range, but they're, they're doing quite well in Texas, at least for now. Very tolerant of salt water. You can even find them in the surf offshore. Um, so this dominance of detritus in the food web um, is not a new finding. I mean, lots of estuarine studies have shown this. And one of the earliest studies was by uh, Rez Darnell in the study of Lake Pontchartrain in Louisiana. Um, there's a quote here, the, the really abundant consumer species of, of the lake community comprise two groups, those that feed heavily upon organic detritus and others that have a broad range of, of food tolerance, meaning broad, broad diets. I actually met Rez Darnell when I first came to Texas A&M uh, back in the early 90s. Uh, he was retired at that point, but he was um, for many years a professor in the oceanography department here at Texas A&M. Um, he passed away quite a number of years ago. Uh, then we did another food web study with our material from Mad Island Marsh, where we use stable isotope methods to try to estimate what the sources of uh, basal production were that were supporting fish biomass. So that's what you see in this table here are um, the mean percentages from the distributions that are estimated from a, an isotopic mixing model. This is a Bayesian mixing model where you input um, not just the isotopic data for potential sources and, and consumers, but also things like um, the variation in those isotopic ratios for the sources and things like the estimated trophic positions of the consumers. And what you end up with is a distribution of solutions. And so what you see are, um, I think those are the um, one standard deviation uh, in parentheses but around the mean. So the values uh, on the left of each column are the mean of the distribution 
So you can sort of consider that a best guess of what the uh, proportional contribution of these sources are to each of these consumers. Now, this doesn't mean that consumers are feeding directly on these basal sources. It means through food chains within the food web, they're supporting fish biomass. And some of these also are, um, are invertebrates. And you can see that uh, C4 plants look like they're making a significant contribution as well as filamentous algae, but all these sources potentially are contributing. Um, and the thing is most of these species and few species feed directly on macrophytes. So very likely this is entering the, the aquatic food web, the metazoan food web, uh, in the form of detritus, uh, probably processed by various decomposers. Another thing we were able to do because we have the <clears throat> dietary, the dietary based analysis um, from gut contents and the stable isotope, <clears throat> excuse me, stable isotope analysis, <clears throat> we could compare our estimates for trophic levels. And you can see that they correlate, but it's not a perfect fit. And it's particularly not a perfect fit for these three species I've highlighted, the Gulf menhaden, the gizzard shad, and the grass shrimp. And I think that's because from dietary analysis, from gut contents, it looks like they're feeding very, very heavily on detritus. But of course, we don't know the composition of that detritus, and we also don't know exactly what they're assimilating out of what you find in, in the gut. So it could be that um, we're getting a higher estimate for trophic level because of additional trophic levels that are in that material in the form of fungi, bacteria, could be even other kinds of microorganisms that themselves are at the next trophic level. And that may be most of the material that these species are actually assimilating. So neither one of these methodologies, the, the take home message here is, is that they're not perfect. They're estimates and there are constraints in, uh, in the, how reliable, precise your estimates are gonna be from either of these methods. <clears throat> okay, now I wanna, take a trip down to South America because I've collaborated with colleagues at a university in the state of Rio Grande do Sul in the very south of, of Brazil along the Atlantic coast. And over the years, uh, <clears throat> I've collaborated extensively with Alexandre Garcia. He's a, a professor at, at the university there in uh, Rio Grande do Sul. You see he's got his, um, his cup of mate there next to him, you know, very popular in Argentina, Uruguay, and also southernmost Brazil. They're, they're, they've always got their, their, it's like tea for them. Um, and they've been studying coastal systems for um, the past couple of decades and, uh, and invited me to collaborate on some of these studies. So the first one I'm gonna tell you about is a food web study. Uh, where we're looking at spatial food web subsidies and hydrological pulsing uh, in this coastal system. So if you can see my cursor again, <clears throat> this system consists of this portion that we call the estuarine uh, ecosystem, which receives water from this drainage through a series of, of channels. And then there's uh, an inlet, uh, an outlet actually that is temporarily closed and temporarily opens up. And that's a function largely of coastal currents and, uh, and perhaps even some wind erosion. And then there's the site one, which we call the freshwater wetland. And the freshwater wetland um, floods when there's periods of high precipitation. And this whole region is, is flat and marshy. This is, on a, this is right on the coast. This is the Atlantic Ocean. 
So when you get periods of high rainfall, all this area floods and, and there's a hydrologic connection between the freshwater wetland and this estuarine system. So here you just see some, some photos when the lagoon mouth is closed and open and we have the flooded condition versus non-flooded. And, and these are C4 grasses that you see out here in the uh, floodplain zone. So we studied this system over um, a couple of years. And there were periods when the lagoon mouth was closed, periods when it opened up and then closed again towards the end of our, our study period. And during the initial period of our study, the area was flooded. There was high rainfall, even preceding April 2008, there was quite high rainfall. So that whole region was flooded. And then the flooding subsided beginning in about September of uh, 2008. And we did a stable isotope analysis of some of the, the basal production sources, as well as some of the uh, macroinvertebrates and, and fish. And so what you see here are just plots of some of these functional groups aggregated uh, for the, um, carbon isotopic ratio and the nitrogen isotopic ratio on the y-axis for the lagoon mouth, estuarine zone, and the freshwater wetland. And what I want you to notice is that the carbon isotopic ratio is higher, it's, it's heavier, more uh, C13 to C12, relatively speaking, in the estuarine zone and near the lagoon mouth near the mouth of the estuary, that outlet area. And so what we did is plug the data into the isotopic mixing model to try to estimate assimilation of various sources. So that's what you see on the x-axis. These two sources, the two to the left, were interpreting as largely of wetland origin. And the three on the right-hand side of the x-axis are of estuarine or origin. So these are some C4 um, grasses. This is cestone. This is suspended particulate organic matter in the water column. But this is cestone from the estuary, estuarine samples. Um, this is microphytobenthos biofilm attached to uh, surfaces at the bottom. And then this is cestone from the freshwater zone and C3 macrophytes from the freshwater zone, aquatic macrophytes. And what we're plotting are two marine fish species that are midwater uh, particle feeders. This uh, left hand column, and we're going through time from April 2008 uh, all the way down to November. And we're doing the same thing for three freshwater, midwater particle feeding fish species. Actually, this, this one's a catfish that's more benthic, but these are all sort of uh, omnivorous and invertebrate feeding fishes. And we have samples from July to November uh, for these species. All of these samples were taken from the estuarine zone, except for these these basal sources from the wetland. Everything else, all these fish were captured in the estuarine zone. So what we're seeing is this is during the, the flood pulse. So the flood pulse is increasing and we're seeing uh, a shift over this way in the resident estuarine fish. So we're seeing these values falling down and these elevating. It, it seems slight, but it's significant. So what we're interpreting this as is there's a pulse of wetland basal resources and fish, because these are also moving down from the wetland into the estuarine zone. So there's hydrological pulsing, and there's a pulse of resources that's going from the wetland into the estuarine zone and subsidizing the consumers in the estuarine food web. And we're seeing the same pattern even with the 
the freshwater fish that are taking up residence in the estuarine zone during this flood pulse. And then the lagoon mouth opened up. And when that happens, you get a flushing of water out of the system and a flushing of some of those um, suspended uh, particulate uh, organic matter resources, and it returns to a more estuarine signature in the food web. So we interpret this as a directional spatial trophic subsidy that's occurring in uh, driven by hydrological pulsing that's driving uh, resources in one direction from the freshwater wetland into the estuarine zone. Here's another study that uh, I did with my colleagues in Rio Grande do Sul. This is uh, for a much larger estuarine system. In fact, this is a very major estuarine system in uh, South America, the Patos Lagoon Estuary. Um, it's, it's this, you can't see it very well, but it's this entire area here that runs along the coast of the state of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. And in this particular study, we just surveyed the lowermost part of the estuary, which is really the area where you see the greatest transition from freshwater to, to more saline or marine conditions when you get here to the outlet. Uh, during much of the year, the upper part of uh, Patas Lagoon is, is actually quite fresh. And we, um, we looked at uh, a long-term survey database from 1996 up to 2000. And uh, my colleagues have continued to study this system. Uh, this is one of Brazil's long-term ecological research locations funded by their National Science uh, Foundation. Um, so they're continuing these studies, but in one of our earlier studies, we had an El Nino event. And what happens when there's an El Nino event is you get higher rainfall in this region of South America, significantly higher rainfall. So that lower part of Patos Lagoon estuary uh, became much fresher with this pulsing of, of fresh water, major freshwater inflow. And you saw a shift in the abundance of estuarine resident fishes, these were fish we classified as, as typically spending their entire life cycle in the estuarine area, and then estuarine dependent marine fish, and then freshwater species, and then marine vagrants that don't necessarily need to, um, to visit estuaries, but sometimes do as sort of vagrants or stragglers. And, and you just see this tremendous shift in community composition that occurred in response to that El Nino and the accompanying freshwater inflows. And you can even see this in the size distributions of these various functional groups of fish. So you see a decline, not just in abundance, but also in, in average size of these estuarine residents and estuarine dependent fish species. And then um, a decline when it returns back to normal conditions. So this is the El Nino state. And when we come out of the El Nino, there's still some freshwater vagrants, but uh, the size distribution is greatly diminished. And then with time, they, they pretty much become rare in, in the lower estuary. Okay, so that's again showing the tremendous influence of, uh, of freshwater inflows on estuarine fish communities and also uh, food webs and ecosystem uh, dynamics. Now, I wanna share with you is one about um, the blending of science and, and management in uh, water policy. So I know that uh, Florida is, uh, is like Texas and like many regions of the world, you have issues with 
freshwater supplies for human use. And of course, there's always the challenge of balancing those needs with the needs of the natural environment. So we would like to uh, protect nature uh, at, at the same time, meet the uh, often increasing human needs for freshwater resources. So in Texas, every five years, we produce a new state water plan. This is sort of a, a wish list of water infrastructure projects um, for the state. Um, I think Florida and Texas, if I'm not mistaken, are the two fastest growing states in terms of population. Um, I think Texas might be number one right now. So we have a growing population and a growing economy and we have limited fresh water supplies. And I already described to you, we have much more water in the east and it's pretty darn dry in the west. And so a lot of our state water plan involves uh, various infrastructure projects that are gonna transport water from east to west to some of our major metropolitan areas. And just briefly, um, several years ago, um, our state legislature passed uh, what everybody refers to as Senate Bill 3, which set up a process for studying the environmental needs for fresh water, not just in our rivers and streams, but in our bays and estuaries. And uh, the process sets up for every major river basin in the state. Um, a stakeholder group, they call these uh, bay, uh, basin and bay area stakeholder committees. So these are very representatives of various entities that have interest in how water is allocated in their basins. And then each of these committees appointed a science team that initially was given one year to come up with recommendations for environmental flows to meet the needs of um, the rivers and streams, repairing uh, ecosystems and estuaries and bays of the state. And all of these recommendations end up with a state agency called the TCEQ, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. And then they're the agency that sets environmental flow standards that then are used by the agency when they issue new water rights. So this is all about allocating new water rights and how we consider environmental needs as we do that. So this is a somewhat of a political process, but it also has a major science component. And this is where I became involved in Senate Bill 3. And one of the first basins that undertook this challenge was in far east Texas the Sabine and Natchez rivers. The Sabine River forms the border between Louisiana and Texas. And the Natchez River is the next basin over. Um, this is typical of most of our rivers in Texas and actually throughout North America. If you look at historic uh, average flows, monthly flows, these are actually daily flows. From 1921 to 1951, if we look at the, the uh, these are actually medians. I don't know why that says average. Um, you know, there was a, there was a wet, wet period in the winter and spring, and then pretty dry in the summer and fall. It wouldn't look like this uh, every single year. These are averages or medians across many years, but it tends to be wet in the winter and spring and it tends to be dry in the, uh, the summer and the fall. And it still shows that pattern today, but it's much attenuated. The difference in magnitude of flow variation is much attenuated. And that's because of water regulation from dams. So we started building dams back in the, in the mid 1950s in Texas. And really we, we sort of stopped building new dams in, uh, in the 1970s. 
but there was a, a boom in dam construction during that period. So the flows we see today are not what they once were. And the approach that um, most of the science teams took on the various um, basins within Texas was to try to figure out the flow regimes that were required to maintain a sound ecological environment. And I don't like this terminology. It's very wishy-washy, but this was actually the, the directive that was given in Senate Bill 3. So this entire effort was to try to figure out the flows required to maintain a sound ecological environment. So believe me, we spent a lot of time debating um, what that means and how to make that definition operational. And we're still debating that. But um, there is pretty universal recognition that we need to follow the um, natural flow regime paradigm. You can't just have one chronic flow and maintain all the biodiversity and ecosystem processes and functions in uh, fluvial ecosystems, you've got to have variation. You've got to have base flow, obviously, but you also need high flow pulses. And some of these high flow pulses um, have different benefits for different functional groups and species within the community of an, uh, a fluvial system. So this was a huge challenge. And what we ended up with uh, in most cases is we came up with an environmental flow matrix. So this is just one example where we break it down month by month. We, we break it down into blocks according to seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And then we would um, try to estimate what the subsistence flows were required to allow the biodiversity to persist through periods of drought. That's what we, we mean by subsistence flows. Base flows are kind of the normal, uh, you know, normal flow conditions when you're not experiencing uh, a flow pulse. And so there were different prescribed base flows for years with different uh, amounts of rainfall during the different seasons. And then we had different tiers of high flow pulses. Pulses with different magnitudes, durations, frequencies. And some of these were recommended for protection. So that's what an environmental flow matrix uh, looks like and, and what the purpose is. And each of the uh, science teams for each of the basins uh, produced a, a big fat report and all this had to be done in, in one year's time. So it was a huge challenge. I actually served on two of these uh, science teams. And then it went to the stakeholders for them to consider and make their own recommendations. And in almost every case, the stakeholders recommended uh, pulse flows that were less than what the science teams recommended, but that's a whole nother story. The story I, I want to share with you um, today is about the lower uh, Neches River. So this is a Google Earth image. This is uh, called Sabine Lake. It's actually one of our bay systems in Texas. It's the one furthest east. So. Um, this is actually the border with Louisiana. This side's Louisiana, this is Texas. This is the city of Beaumont. This is the city of uh, Port Arthur. And this is a major, um, major port on the Gulf Coast. This is one of the most active ports along the Gulf Coast. There's a lot of uh, petrochemical uh, industry and shipping that occurs out of this port. A lot of industry in Beaumont as well. And to get the ship traffic through Sabine Lake, Sabine Lake is naturally uh, fairly fresh. It's our shallowest and freshest of, uh, of, our, of our bay systems in Texas. Uh, and it has this narrow outlet here. 
And what's happened over the years is the Army Corps of Engineer has deepened and widened the ship channel that allows larger ships like those carrying uh, the tankers carrying petroleum to get up to the ports in Port Arthur. Um, as a result, the saline wedge, the saltwater wedge that always occurs in these coastal systems has been able to penetrate further upstream into the lower niches. So it's extended the estuarine zone further inland, upriver in the, in the lower Neches River. I'll show you a closer up image in a moment. Well, so my first involvement with this system in the lower Neches and Sabine Lake was through the SB3 work. But a few years later, I was contacted by the National Park Service and the folks that um, are with the Big Thicket Preserve Network in East Texas, because they had acquired um, a large piece of property on the Lower Neches uh, that they called it the um, Lower Cypress Unit, and they added it to their preserve network. And it's really nice bottomland hardwood forest. It's a wetland that's dominated by bald cypress and water tupelo and other wetland uh, tree species, basically a swamp, swamp forest. And they were interested in having us do a study to figure out what were the environmental flow needs to maintain the integrity of that, um, that swamp forest. And so we initiated a project that they funded uh, to survey and try to figure out what's going on with the relationship between freshwater flow, salinity, other environmental parameters, and, and the fish fauna. And there were some things we didn't know about when we embarked on this study. <clears throat> First of all, we did know that there was a saltwater barrier here on the river above the city of Beaumont. And the reason that saltwater barrier was put in, um, I guess it was about 20 years ago, maybe 15, was to protect the fresh water supplies for the city of Beaumont. The city of Beaumont draws their, much of their fresh water from the Neches River. And because of the ship channel and the saltwater wedge coming all the way up here now, they installed this barrier so during periods of low flow, they dropped the gates and blocked the flow of water to protect the fresh water upstream for the use by the city of Beaumont. So we knew about that feature, but what I didn't know about was this feature. This is a pond that collects the paper mill effluent from a paper mill located about 35 miles to the north. It flows through an open canal and collects here. So this is, this is just dissolved organic material from the paper mill. And there's a pipe that goes underground and the water flows out to the bottom of the Natchez River. And then the river flow dilutes and carries it down to Sabine Lake and ultimately to the Gulf of Mexico. And that's the way it's supposed to work. And that's the way it normally does work when there's sufficient flow in the Neches River. So we got out there and, and we did our surveys uh, for fish, measured environmental variables at, at sites up and down the lower Neches and inside the lower Cypress tract. This ended up uh, contributing to the master's thesis of Rebecca Paisano Torres. And uh, other students in the lab, like Dan Fitzgerald here, uh, helped out on the project. Here's a picture of the saltwater barrier when the gates are open. So when the gates are open, which is most of the time, uh, water flows freely. But as luck would have it, when we were out there doing our project, Texas experienced the drought of record. The, the driest, hottest year that's been recorded in Texas to date occurred in 2010 and 2011, that period. And so this is a hydrograph 
for the Lower Natchez River uh, during the period that we were doing our study. And you can see that uh, the flow got really, really low for an extended period of time. And I'm not going to show you all the analyses we did because um, we're running out of time. Uh, but, you know, as you might expect, it got saltier below the barrier and was fresh above the barrier. So the barrier functioned exactly like it was designed to function. So we saw more freshwater species above. Uh, relatively fewer below and mostly estuarine and marine species below. This is combined for all the samples throughout the whole period. Uh, just comparing above and below the barrier for gillnet samples, which are larger fish, and seine samples, which are small fish for the most part. Uh, the contrast isn't quite as great for the small fish, but the same trend was there. And this is a Google Earth image from November 11th, 2011, near the end of that drought of record. And the color of that water is, is true in this Google Earth image. The water below the barrier was black. And it was black because there was a buildup of all that paper mill effluent, all that dissolved organic matter was not getting flushed out of the system. It was just collecting. And we did see some dead fish. We caught fewer fish. It was definitely saltier. So the salinity got up to, um, you know, as high as 16 uh, parts per thousand. This is towards the end, November, December. It started raining a little bit in December, 2011. The DO got down to, two and three milligrams per liter, where it was a lot higher above the barrier. So it got really nasty. And we actually uh, provided the eFlow um, recommendations that were requested, but we also um, had to admit that it's virtually impossible to produce those flows during periods of drought. The system has been too altered by human infrastructure. And there's, there's just no way I can see to go back. And so we predicted that some of these um, tree species, wetland loving trees were probably gonna die because they just don't have the salinity tolerance. And we actually saw the beginnings of that um, in the riparian area closest to the water courses. So these are dead bald cypress. These are recently dead trees. I mean, that's an old dead tree, but these died as a result of the drought of 2010, 2011. So our prediction is that that bottomland hardwood wetland over time is gonna to convert to an herbaceous coastal wetland. I just think it's inevitable. So uh, just quickly, some conclusions. Um, obviously the distribution and abundance of species in estuaries changes all the time. That's not surprising, uh, but freshwater inflows are a major, major driver. And some of these um, variations in freshwater flow are large scale drivers that have huge, immediate and huge impacts. And some are local scale drivers that affect hydrology, as I've just shared with you on the Lower Natchez River in Texas. And then of course, food web structure and dynamics is gonna follow from those changes in community structure. And uh, finally, you know, all over the world, we're stressing these estuarine systems uh, because of human needs for fresh water and also things like climate change that are increasing the frequency and, uh, and severity of some of these large scale climatic uh, events. And I think uh, with that, it's, um, it's time to, to end the talk and see if uh, anybody's still with us. And if we do have time, I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, thanks Kirk for a great talk. Um, we are, just up about 
four o'clock. So if there are any questions for Kirk, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can uh, drop a question in the in the chat. 